practice and awareness, I think every day to know that yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to surround myself with, with those smarter and we don't have it figured out. So we need people to help us figure it out together. My approach is mainly collaborative. I know that I have the authority. My card does say the title, but that doesn't mean that you have to act like you're the only person that contributes. Hi, I'm Nick Warner. As a dad, a lucky husband, and as a business coach, I value people and relationships above all else. But next is winning, sustainability, and healthy culture. I've been a business owner for 25 years and served for decades as a special advisor to business and government leaders at all levels. Let's just say I've seen some stuff. My passion and my expertise are helping motivated professionals and businesses find the highest level confluence of what they want in life and business. This is what it feels like to be together at the top. Thank you to our sponsors, Shoals Brick and Rogaski, Three Bridges Consulting, Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips, and Connect Strategies. And Day is the president of Praces, P-R-A-E-S-E-S, a Shreveport, Louisiana-based technology company operating in aerospace, corrections, manufacturing, defense, insurance and shipbuilding. Wow. And leads the company's strategic, operational and business development efforts. She started as an individual contributor 17 years ago on a regular old company sales team. And now she's the president of the company with well over 100 employees under her. My title for this interview, Anne, is from the ground floor to the president of the company. And Day, where are you right now? And welcome to Together at the Top. Hi, greetings. I am here in our uh lovely city of Shreveport, Louisiana, which is where our company is based. And I'm probably in the office, actually. We still come to the office nowadays. Nice. I love it. Okay. So we can't get into the meat of this without me congratulating you on your LSU Lady Tigers, 2023 NCAA champions, biggest ever national title audience for a women's basketball game. What do you think of that? How about them Tigers? Absolutely. And what a stud of a win for Kim, the coach. And I think one of the, my favorite things about it is just how she embraced her team afterwards. It wasn't an individual victory for her. She totally embraced the team and really praised the entire group. That was really cool. Yeah, really. You must be really stoked. Absolutely stoked. Absolutely. Hey, so Together at the Top has been on an emerging and younger leaders kick recently. So this is a great opportunity for us all to learn from you, from your obvious triumphs and probably not as evident hurdles and stumbles. Can't wait to get started. You ready to roll? Well, let's do it. All right, let's do it. Let's start with your background. And uh, you were a branch manager at Enterprise after college in sales right out of the gate. Tell us about your first job and what you took away. You know, uh, I don't credit the management program at Enterprise enough, but they put you through a pretty rigorous management training program. And that's really sort of the very beginning of your career there. You're in training for about six months before you can really apply for any of the other positions. But um, that company, and at the time it was a smaller family owned company, they send you in to this program in St. Louis and they spend a lot of time really focusing on management, on customer service, dealing with difficult people, um, multitasking and really things that, you know, in, throughout your career, you sort of take for granted. But at the very beginning, you have no idea how to do. And there's a lot of emphasis and follow through on that training. And so it just served really as a great base. Before you took on the position and I ended up as a branch manager at the uh, airport here in Shreveport to really make you think about all of the different factors that make you successful at your job. Give us a little detail. I wasn't planning to ask you too much detail, but it's actually because it was really foundational. It sounds like what are a couple things or a few things you took away? Yeah. Real, so, <laughs> you know, not many people know uh, that running a branch for Enterprise rent car is more than just getting the car pulled up, right? and uh, making sure it's ready to go. But interfacing with a certain type of public, interfacing with a certain type of customer at the airport specifically, you've got people that are in a hurry, that are ready to go, give me the keys. You know, and this is really before some of the automation of technology that we have to deal with today. So there was a lot of time and effort spent on the emphasis of dealing with people. Um, so that was a really huge takeaway. The second aspect of it was understanding how to manage the data of the branch and uh, what makes what are certain factors that are, you know, successful for that branch? You know, the kind of cars, the type of fees that are charged for, uh, on those vehicles, how long they're out, the maintenance, just tremendous amount of information. And it was really broken down to 
really in certain aspects that are easy to digest. So you as a manager with all the fast paced activity, you could really make sense of it. So there's that aspect of it. And then the other, which is what people really see is rolling up your sleeves. Literally, Enterprise was very big on establishing a professional presence with with its public. So we literally were in suits and button downs, by the way, which they had a program to help people coming out of college buy said clothes so that you could look presentable. However, when you've got to get someone in a car, it's what you're rolling up your sleeves, you're vacuuming the car, you're washing the car. And even though you may be the branch manager and you have people trained to do that, you're right there rolling up your sleeves. So it's really, it, it was the team dynamic, the uh, team collaboration, like everybody's in so we can succeed. In addition to all the other components, um, really, you learned a lot in a very short amount of time. Yeah, really good stuff. Was there a time early on, it might have been an enterprise or it might have been just early on in your career, a situation, a competitive emotion uh, where you started to think, I want this. Like, I might really have what it takes to do something here. When did you know you had this stuff, Anne? <laughs> uh, it's funny to, uh, to think back about it because I was so very young. Like, enterprise was really outside of the service industry and also in combination with was really the big first big girl job that that I had. It really probably comes down to the fact that I exited enterprise when I was eight months pregnant with my oldest. And you can only wash so many cars when you're sticking out to here and you're leading customers out. And so I just I had an opportunity to take a break because I, I had him. We were young, young parents then. And it was then that I really spent a bit of time and I thought to myself, OK, what I want to do. And you reflect on, gosh, I really like to deal with people. I'm not bad at this numbers thing. And so at that point in time, and, you know, being young parents, you got to get a job. You got to get back out there. It really opened my eyes to the fact that I want to do something with business. I need to talk to people. I need to connect with people. And I really wanted to make sense and I wanted to be meaningful. I want the value to be there for the customer. But I had no idea what I was going to do. (laughs) What words would you use to describe you in your first 10 years of your career? So while I attribute a lot of the learning at Enterprise, I really didn't see a career until I started here at Prasis. The first 10 years were challenging, a lot of work, growth, learning, training, excitement, partnerships, travel. (laughs) But beyond anything else, it was hard work and training and, and really mentorship. So that describes the work challenging, uh, a lot of growth, learning, collaboration. Talk about you. What adjectives would you have given you during those same years? Oh, goodness. I was I was so young. How young were you at that time? I was 24 oh, when wow. I started Prasis. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Which the positive of that was I was so young. I was hungry. I was determined. I was willing to do just about anything. I was a sponge for information. I was also very inexperienced, yet confident (laughs) in some instances, probably arrogant. But, you know, really all of those things combined just made me want to work harder and harder to help my team out, to make my mentors proud, to grow within the company, to make my clients happy and to fulfill just the need to grow within myself and really challenge myself to, to see what I'm capable of. I love the words you used were, let's see, where's my clock? We are. Eight minutes and 32 seconds into this interview, I got my first goosebumps. It started with, you said hungry, and then determined and sponge and confident, arrogant. Probably, I don't know about arrogant, because I don't find you arrogant, confident for sure. Uh, I'm getting to know you better in this hour than I may have coming in, but I might use those same words to describe you now. What words would you use now? Yeah, hungry for sure. What what words would you use now, 10 years later, or some years later? Some years later, uh, I didn't want to do all the math. So some years we later, we can do it on the tenure, <laughs> just not on the age. But um, I'd hope to say that less arrogant, more humble, patient, still hungry, still determined, still collaborative, very team oriented, wiser, hopefully, still a sponge, <laughs> still uncertain, grateful, very grateful, invigorated in some instances. Really cool. Yeah, you just you get an opportunity to sort of rebrand and uh, reshape how you work with people. Yeah, it's a perfect segue because I want to talk about coming up through sales. Let's talk about sales because you came up to the sales side of the shop as opposed to logistics, legal, finance, or seems like most commonly these days and through their expertise in technology. So let me set the stage with a couple of facts because I really want to get your comment on this and learn from you. Entrepreneur.com. 
in an article about transition from sales into higher level management positions like you have now and how to do it states in the tech industry, just 8% of CEOs and presidents at the largest 100 US firms have primary background in sales, 8%, and less than 30% have any sales experience at all. According to a 2017 study by Corn Ferry Institute, in an article, they talk about how companies can do a better job at recognizing leadership within sales positions, and salespeople should recognize that they can do higher level roles as well. Comment on coming up through sales, again, 8%. Of presidents and CEOs come up the way you came up. It really surprised me when I read that. So I do need to give credit where credit is due because I had a responsibility in business development, which is very different than sales. We were extremely blessed to have multiple people involved in sales and business development alongside us. So the division that I worked in for about, gosh, 15 years and really ultimately responsible for it was a very, very heavy blend of operations and taking care of our existing clients and participating, and I say participating intentionally in sales and business development, because you can grow through sales while you're not the primary person to do it. So majority of my job through my tenure was to work with our clients. And as I mentioned earlier, getting to know people, connecting with people, make sure that they receive value and what you're doing is just so important to me. And as part of that, it's almost, it almost becomes natural to hear about the additional challenges and struggles that they have. And oftentimes that actually results in some sort of an upsell, you know, within their contract. And so a lot of that was just very natural without being a sales effort. So learning that over time was extremely valuable because you're, you're understanding how to listen to people. You're thinking about how to solve challenges differently than the operational side. But in addition to that, we had, like, like, as I mentioned, we had a tremendous uh, business development person that actually went out and drummed up the work, right? So where I got to come in and the sales portion that I really, uh, I think, finally got to do well at the end of my <laughs> position before I transitioned was to come in and supplement the context of how what we do will you know, will be valuable to them. So it was like that real world experience as opposed to just the initial efforts of unearthing the opportunity. So I would say that my sales portion was actually more indirect than it was direct. And I think it was for that reason that I was challenged to really think about interacting with both current and potential customers in a very different way. You make an interesting distinction. I think I understand academically the difference between business development and sales, but you made an interesting distinction. You said it this way, but I'd like to hear you say more about it. You talked about, I wasn't the primary person doing it. Somebody was out there drumming it up and you were the business development person. Say a little bit more about your thoughts on the bifurcation between that. And maybe you didn't consider yourself in sales. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong in how you think about that. Yeah, I think I was a contributor and I had a responsibility to grow the division but I was not the primary um, salesperson. And I think, as I mentioned, I, I, sales and business development are two different things. In some instances, sales is more of something tangible that you can touch, you know, a little bit more product, more transactional. The service, which it was unique in a niche industry and in some instances without competition, made it really complex. And so in order to sell something in that develop, in that environment, it really is business development because it takes time to understand who needs your service, why they need it, how to approach it. And that that process and that cycle is really just long. And so while we had someone to actually do the, all of that legwork, my role in the business development cycle was really to marry the real world, what is happening in the industry to the potential clients and their needs. And oftentimes meet with those potential clients, help them understand exactly what we do because when you're providing a service, even a consulting service, it's challenging for someone to wrap their head around it and really figure out, unlike, you know, an iPhone that you can see and touch, how what you're talking about is going to make a difference in their lives. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's really interesting, a differentiation between sales and business development. And uh, all the while, whether you knew you had your higher floors of the building or not, you obviously were getting training and, and seeing things that helped you get there. Many say the best CEO and the CEO of the future is the former CTO, chief technology officer turned CEO. And I talked to some of my clients about this. I think they should come from the business and sales side and surround themselves with technologists who speak business. What do you think? Well, I think that it's always better to know someone smarter in the room, knowing every aspect of the business. And I would actually challenge it and say 
sales, absolutely, but also very operationally. So understanding from the very beginning what you do, how you do it, the best way to help somebody else is that hybrid of, you know, a COO, a salesperson. That to me is some of the secret sauce. And then to your point, marrying that up with technical talent, people that are smarter than you that, you know, come from a, you know, that specialized environment makes a dream team. You know how I feel about team sport. Team sport. You get stoked. Absolutely. With your indulgence, let's talk about women in business or you being a woman in top business. Um, and you're a woman killing it at high levels of business. Um, again, just to, just to level set with some stats, according to bizjournals.com, among all the leadership positions held by women in 2021, at the end of 2021, just 6% were at the highest tiers, meaning CEOs, presidents, or COOs. Most were support roles overseeing enterprise functions such as HR, finance, or legal. This is from a listener email. One of the things I've taken to doing is I've taken to teasing the guests coming up with some of the listeners to see what they might want to hear in advance. So this is from a listener email. And you always hear how women get to higher management positions faster than men these days, but have a more difficult time doing it once they're there, meaning they have to put in more work and be 10 times better than every man around them. As a listener, it would be interesting to see what Ann thinks of this. And, and she's a woman at the highest levels of business. Please ask her. So I'm just asking you. You know, I think doing the job when you're in this position is harder regardless. You know, I try to think about the distinction of being a female leader doing it versus just a leader doing it. And doing your job in this role versus doing your job in a prior role, is just it's just more challenging, period. And it takes a lot longer to get into a groove than you would expect, which is really frustrating for successful people. But that said, I will attribute uh, that there are different challenges, not to say that they're female. And a lot of that for me comes from the mom aspect, because I am the one responsible for A through Z for the kids. And I'm thankful that they're older and uh, independent. But, you know, I can't travel. Well, I, I won't say I can't. Taking care of a household, taking care of your family, and then balancing travel is really challenging. Absolutely. Is it possible? Yes. Yeah. It comes back to you figuring out how to really how to balance everything, how to prioritize everything, and most importantly, leaning on your support system. Say more about that. Talk about role of family, because I think that's where you're going with that. And maybe friends too. It's family, it's mentors, it's colleagues, you know. When you get to a certain level, it's like there's almost that expectation that you have to know it all or figure it out on your own. And it's one of the things I've just realized is false. And it forces you to be a little humble because you realize that you're actually more dependent than ever so that you don't feel isolated and you don't feel like you're alone. For me, my family, my support system, friends, mentors have been vital. Communication with them, where the struggles are is huge because the first thing you have to do is you have to admit that you're struggling or that you need help. Lots of focus on mental health. So really all of those components, plugging them into your life in order to be successful are key. And every day we found a new reason to ask for help. And I think a lot of people wouldn't expect that's what you'd say. Like you're here. Of course you have it all figured out. You're Ann Day. You're a superwoman. You don't need help. You're Nick Warner. You're Superman. You don't need help. Yes, I assure you I do. A client's, I can't square this client up. I have to get home. I can't do this trip. I really like what you said, because I, I naturally said you got to ask for help from family and you stretch that way outside family. But starting with humility, I'm really impressed by that. It makes an impression on me is what I mean to say at your high level. You know, my family is incredible. Um, my dad taught me how to work hard. My dad taught me how to not give up. And I, I attribute a lot of that to how he really mentored me and coached me throughout the years. I was very young when I lost my mom. So he really took the lead to demonstrate what hard work looks like. An equally diligent, intelligent, smart, hardworking is my younger sister. And she's a powerhouse. And so being able to, even though we're six years apart, starting to exchange ideas about, well, what are you going through that's important in a completely different market, in a completely different industry, in a, with also with a different generation has been tremendously helpful. And then my own kids, they <laughs> now know more than ever that mom is not perfect. And sometimes they have, they do have to remind me, they're like, you know, you're not at work running the company. We're having a conversation. Oh, that is familiar to me from <laughs> wife, from friends, from yeah, kids, from managing. sister, all the, yeah, yeah. But they're incredible because it's challenging when you have the same company being a presence in your life for such a long time. Ethan, he's now 19. He's known about Praises since he was four months old. 
And, you know, Lily was born into Precis and it's, you know, a company event here and going to a meeting and bear with me, I'm going to dinner. But they also know my coworkers <laughs> and we all know each other's children. So, you know, when you have to have such a buy-in from your kids, it's, it's important. And especially if they know how they're contributing is important. So I'm not perfect. I try to bring them into my world as much as possible. I've taken my daughter on multiple trips with me where, where I can just so that they understand it, right? Do you say sorry? Sorry, not sorry. I say sorry at times. I've said sorry to my kids for sure about work things or temperament things or, um, you know, I think it's important for the, especially when we're running companies and they know we're a big deal, we screw up and I try to do what I work to on my stuff. But with my kids, I want part of humility is say, I blew that. Or you've talked to the top of my head too many times. I got to leave my phone in the car. I'm super sorry. What was this? Do you see my hit dad? Oh, I didn't. I didn't see, I was at the game, but I didn't see it. I'm really sorry. I'm going to try to stop doing that and like be human with them as well. Cause you made that point about we're not running the company, we're at home. And part of that is humility is I blew it. I'm trying to get better. Sorry. That is a huge growth area still for me, especially over the last two years where, you know, you're in the presidency. Yeah, it, it takes work. And now my kids will tell you, I don't say I'm, I'm sorry enough. You know, we try to set certain boundaries when we sit down to dinner. It's like, okay, phone's down. Or we go to a play and it's like, you know, phone's down. But no, I don't think I, I do that enough. And uh, that's a growth area for me. I really want to get there. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. The law firm of Shoals, Brick, and Rogaski is a go-to partner for me. I work the most with partner Michael Rogaski. I go to them for business contracts, strategic legal counsel to maneuver through our round complex business situations, HR and employee issues, startup needs, intellectual property protections, collection matters, and recently the purchase or sale of a business. I really like the fact they tell me if they're not the best fit and they give me a warm referral if I need it. Also, unlike so many attorneys are totally level-headed and calm. I've experienced it like their slogan says, small firm service, large firm result. Contact Michael Rogaski at sbrlawsd.com. Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips is as creative and as willing a travel partner as you can find. These days, you can plan a lot of trips on your own, but for those trips that require more intricate planning, tons of time or local contacts and savvy, Kathy's the best. My family and friends have worked with her countless times in every travel country, setting and season you can think of. Contact Kathy with a C at shipsandtripstravel.com. Let's talk about recruitment and retention. In pre-production, you talked about your role in building culture, helping remove hurdles and making sure everyone feels that their contribution matters. In 2022, Zipia.com says companies lost 18% of their workforce to turnover on average. It's about one in five people annually. 12% was voluntary by the employees, 6% involuntary, meaning layoffs and terminations. First up reports 64% of organizations have said their biggest struggle is recruitment and retention. We read so much about it and comment on how you think about your role in culture and how that impacts finding and then keeping really good people. Oh, that is a, such a good question because to me, people are at the heart of what we do here anywhere. And I would say culture here is very intentional. The company has spent a tremendous amount of time long before, you know, I came in and I'm sure through a variety of, you know, <laughs> trials, what's work, what's not work, clear core values. Our value is in our people. Everything we do is for a reason and we bring more value than we cost. And pair that up with a culture where we specifically look for people that are intelligent, friendly, have high integrity, high work ethic. When you stay true to those principles and you really uh, look for people that exhibit those qualities, you create a, a culture that is really amazing. And then the hard part is to honor it, live it a day in and day out and demonstrate that we, we you know, we stay true to that. We're family friendly, um, collaborative, hardworking, all of those things. So trying to go after employees, going after staff and, and team members in our current dynamic is, is challenging because on one hand, what COVID did was opened up remote work, you know, for everybody, people that we wouldn't get to work with us. I'm so blessed we've added to the team. We've got on the team. And previously, I wouldn't have gotten. But the flip side of that, competition out there is fierce. 
You know, there's so much more available opportunities for the, those people that may have not been able to look for remote work either. So the value of culture is, is huge. Trying to figure out how to engage with your team members, trying to make sure that they understand that we work hard and we have expectations, but we have, you know, flexibility is, is really, really important. Communication, learning from your employees and allowing them to contribute, like they have a stake in the game and, and contribute to solutions is, is really v- very valuable. So I'm thrilled to say that, you know, when you pay attention to culture, you know, you pay attention to what makes it true and what's gotten, what's made you successful, but you also look at how it evolves and you try to stay, you know, as current as possible and really get ahead of it. I think it's important because then you retain people, right? You retain key people. And now every year that goes by, they have the the notion and they have the they can contribute to the things that may not be perfect. And then they themselves have an interest of really relaying that to the newer teams and, and the growing team. And so with that combination, I found that it's, it's easier to retain people and to help them understand why what you do is different than someone that may have just different pay or better benefits. Yeah, one of the things I've observed over time in in companies that I've run and been involved in, companies I've worked for and now as a coach is the culture things are easy to say, they're easy to write, they're easy to live when things are fine, and they're much harder to live when things are really, really hard in the company or there's a stressful, aberrant situation. How do those things hold together? How do you think about that when things are really, really tough? Raising voices, stress, dictatorial someone's opinion doesn't matter right now because it's too hot. How do you handle that? How do you, how have you observed that over time when things are really hard? Does it hold? I think that's when you slow down a bit. Two and a half years ago, yeah. I guess it's been now. I think our employee retention was at its lowest. And while I worked for the company, I was, you know, I guess I was somewhat blind to it. I was in, in a completely different position, but we had low retention because we focused on a lot of things that weren't our employees. And the employees weren't the focus when they when they should have been. And if we were hearing them, we weren't we weren't following through as well as we could have. And sometimes that happens, right? It's it's not it's not intentional. You get busy. You're trying to grow. There's a lot of excitement to grow. Markets look like. And so that's what I stepped into as a president. (laughs) You know, my door was literally open and I had folks coming in with a resignation almost like weekly for three months. And it was people you don't want to lose. And so then you you have to sit back. And to your point, it's like, okay, we can talk about culture and, and values and all the things. It's like, what do you do? So you've got to spring into action. You got to come up with a plan that allows for people to be heard. And it's it's reasonable. You can make an impact in short sprints. But it, it, it really is, like I said, you just got to, you've got to slow down. Yeah. You talk about learning from your employees. It's a good time to learn from your employees too. When we are losing people you don't mean to lose, that is no bueno. You put it all on the table and you have to look internally and say, what happened? What well, I don't know everything. You guys see it. So tell me, what is it going to take? And then I would think also you need to learn from your predecessors. You're learning from your employees, but also you're taking over from two people, or at least two in the modern area that just in researching the company have led this company before. They happen to be men. I don't know. Maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't. But studying what worked, what didn't work, um, people coming in your door to resign. Uh, there's a lot of studying for you to do. And it sounds like it was content rich at the time. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And our history has been that we, I mean, we still have people that have been here for 25 plus years, right? So that's, we value ourselves in retaining clients for a long period of time, retaining our employees. So to have something like that happen, it shakes you to the core and talk about a humbling experience where you have to really roll up your sleeves and listen to the people that you work with. And then do something about it. Yeah. A lot of humility. You show up in these rooms. I don't really necessarily mean you and Dave, but I've worked for a lot of leaders. I've been a leader. You're a leader. You show up in that office with a new fancy business card that says president or CEO or director and decide you got it all figured out. Good luck to you. The clock's ticking on you. You got I mean, I really urge people to be humble and open your ears at the level you're at. The propensity or the predisposition is uh, like, I earned this job. I got it figured out. Let's go. There's big peril in that, deciding you got it all figured out. Am I correct in that? As I look at your face, I'm guessing I'm correct because, yeah. It's, you know, and I've stumbled across it multiple times and, you know, I'll probably stumble it because as you grow, and I mentioned this earlier, some of it is probably, you know, self-inflicted where you think you're expected to know and you're expected to perform to a certain point because you've been in business for 20 years and you've been in leadership for over 15. And so sometimes that really, really 
impacts your ability to be curious, you know, which can cause some of that arrogance. And then you think you've got it together and then you make you make a mistake or make a bad decision. So it, it absolutely is practice and awareness. I think every day to know that yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to surround myself with, with those smarter and we don't have it figured out. So we need people to help us figure it out together. So my approach is mainly collaborative. I know that I have the authority. My card does say the title, but that doesn't mean that you have to act like you're the only person that contributes. It doesn't. I like words and I listen to words. Even if I talk too much at times, I'm a really good listener. And you said I mainly listen to others. And I will observe, I'm going to say this and then you can pick at it, including if you disagree. There is a time and a place where I'm going to go because for me, it's I can see this. I see it right away. We're doing it. I'm taking input. I'm either seeing it your way or I'm not seeing your way and we're going to go. It's probably five to 10 to 15% of the time, but I'm really good at seeing the playing field. That's how I got here. And there's a time and a place to take the input and then do what you got to do with it. And it may not always be exactly what your team wanted you to do. And way more times than not, you're going to be right. I I agree with that. And, you know, boy, do you have to be comfortable with dealing with, you know, the disagreement at times, but to your point, you see it, you can feel it. And you're like, I know this is exactly the way we have to do it. The grumblings will come. Hopefully people have worked with you long enough to trust you and to give you that that space to help lead through the decision. But yeah, when it works out, it works out. And, uh, you know, the longevity really speaks to that because sometimes you, you really have to take the reins and go with it. Yeah. Thinking about you as a young salesperson or a business development person more accurately since you've touched me up on that and knowing that probably five years ago, from my, as I understand your life, this call, this uh, interview we're having is in a hotel room or a hotel lobby or somewhere on the road. I know, at least I understand from pre-production, you're not traveling as much, but I'd be remiss and derelict if we didn't ask you to talk about your experience traveling, because I've seen you in a lot of states, you had a national portfolio, Um, you worked your way to that office and you worked your way mostly off the road, but talk about the coming up, the goods, the bads, the opportunities afforded you, the, you know, the stress and the uh, unhealthy parts of it. I'd love to have a chance to learn from you about the business travel that you, I'd say, endured or had the opportunity to do for a lot of years. Oh, goodness. Right. And endure is a good word because that can be a, when I think about 15 years ago and where technology was, you know, to get a meeting, to move a contract along, to get someone excited about it, you had to be in person, right? And most successful contracts, whether it's a, an upsell or a new contract, it takes three to four meetings easily. And uh, while we are a small company based out of Little Shreveport, Louisiana, our clients were nationwide. So in any given week, you're on the West Coast to, to up north to Florida. So it, it was a challenge, but it was a good challenge. And for many, many years, I really just thrived on getting in front of people and really connecting with them, whether it was a business development meeting, whether it was an operational meeting with an opportunity to upsell or just nine times out of 10, it was like something's on fire and you really had to get in the room to figure out how to do it. So, you know, I've seen incredible places. I've traveled to, to places I never thought I would be. So that was all the positive aspects of it. You know, the, the network you build, the relationships you build, not just with your customers, but the vendors you work with and other partners. It's incredible. You know, when you get to learn how to play golf or cornhole or go visit a museum or tour Alcatraz that you just would never get. That was the positive aspect of it. The challenge really balancing it because at any given, on any given month, I could be gone two to three weeks, you know, for two to three weeks out of the month for two to three days each. And so balancing school assignments and recitals, it's tough. And, you know, I've missed two birthdays while traveling and I won't do it again. Yeah, me too. Those (laughs) hurt my heart. Those are really difficult. And still to this day, my, my kids will say, oh, you missed that one. Well, so now you're president of the company. You have these people coming up under you and you know their pressures, you know the upside and the downside. I coach an, a, a growing number of emerging leaders and uh, some people that have come out of the field, like let's say they're technologists or um, they could be lawyers and now they have a biz, they have business responsibility. They've got to grow accounts, they've got to get accounts. And there's a lot of trepidation, especially post-COVID in travel. And it's not because of the COVID, it's because of habits that were built or never learned. But I also, like you, I mean, I'll be a little more acute about it. I mean, I really struggled at times with the business travel and the stress also, but the business travel took me away from my family, my friends, my office, my gym, 
you know, any uh, good eating habits, like things like that. So how do you think about that for your emerging staff and um, people that have young families, but you re- they got to deliver. How does it work? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I think it's really just setting the expectations, but the positive aspect of COVID was general acceptance in the country that there are things that you could do virtually. So, you know, you're forced to think about it as a, as a manager, as a leader, and really as an employee. Is this meeting vital in person? Can I save two days of travel and have it virtually and still extract the same information and still be effective? Like it's, I think it's a, it's a balance. I don't know that we have it a hundred percent down, but it's, it comes down to expectations with your clients, with your employees, and especially with your teams, it goes back to culture, right? Knowing that you are building a, a good culture and you show flexibility and the fact that family is important. So when I, when we have to get the job done and it requires travel, it requires travel and we have to be there and we have to get this done. But what do you need me to do to help you support around it? You know? You need a day off beforehand on the on the back end. Do you want to catch an earlier flight? Maybe it's a couple hundred bucks more to get you home. Let's do that. But when we're there and we need to be there in the meeting, let's we got to get it done. Yeah, I'm not interviewing you because I agree with everything you say. I just happen to agree with everything you're saying right now. Part of, of what I'm trying to do is I expand both my practice and also the podcast attached to it is I don't want to just be around people I always agree with. I want to be around people that challenge me and that might even give me notions I don't agree with. But I really agree with what you're saying. And I have some older executives that see what you just said is soft. And then my retort is, let me see your um, retention numbers. They're not retaining people. They, our meetings are about losing people they don't mean to meet, but they're really you know, opposed to the softy culture. I'm like, it's not softy culture. It's a business culture. It's a bottom line culture. It happens to respect humans person by person, but it's also about your bottom line, sir or ma'am. Uh, sometimes I make progress. Sometimes I do not <laughs> on that. Well, and I think there's a, there's also something to say about that too, right? Like so what you call older culture or, you know, a different mentality. There's a lot to learn from that. You know, that generation grew up working like they didn't know where the next time was going to come from. They put in the trips and, you know, they made the phone calls and it's tremendous lessons to be learned. But, you know, I think it's like anything else and maybe it is softy culture, but I'll stand by it. It's like anything else. You have to evolve and see just where humanity, where people, where your workforce is coming from. And so it's a strategic decision. You can make the decision that this is how I will operate. But if I decide I'm going to pull a lever here and there, tame that mentality and now just apply the new concepts to it, boy, you could be so much more successful and more powerful. And like you said, it comes down to like your retention. When you have people, and I'm blessed to work with people like this, I get goosebumps too, that go out of their way to come back and thank you for, man, I got home last night and I was able to catch the last 20 minutes of this game. Or man, thank you so much for letting me, you know, only have to be there for two thirds of this, this conference. That energy that comes with them fuels back into their work. I can't ask for more than that. Yeah. And I would urge the manager, the executives, pay attention. Like the more you care, the more you pay attention, the better productivity. It's kind of simple stuff. But when I get the, um, I'm calling it old school. It's not always old school. It's not even always older. It's just a mentality, like a traditional mentality. If I can't get them on the feeling, I can almost get them on the, almost always get them on the fact. Show me your recruitment attention numbers. And recruitment will be impacted too because people call into people they know in the company, in most companies and find out how it is. So you don't, it's a silent killer. You're not losing them because you're never getting them in the first place because their friends are telling them, oh, it's tough here. Right. There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. You talked about being the dumbest one in the room, which having, knowing you some and getting to know you better, I know is euphemistic and you're never the dumbest person in the room. But what do you have to have on your teams, especially your most important teams? What are the personality traits you need when you're in that room and it's on? Oh, way to give me a hard question. <laughs> that um, well, on the flip side is you want to answer it this way is what can't you have? I want to know both. What do you have to have? and What can't you have on a team? A go to market team. How about I answer both? Yes, ma'am. Please do. I can't arrogance in a negative way and just constant negative Neil, negative Nancy. Those are culture killers on the team. And when you're in small teams or large teams or media sized teams, that gets you absolutely nowhere. What I have to have in the room is, and I, th- look, this is still something I, I, I struggle with and as I learn, but what you have to have in the room is someone that represents a successful area, tactical standpoint. You know, if you're dealing with something that's really complicated from a technology standpoint, make sure you have your technical person. If that's going to impact future 
customers, make sure you, you have someone for marketing or business development. So knowing how to build not too big of a team because then you won't get anywhere because everybody will have an opinion, not too small because then you're going to leave somebody out. I think is, is you know, it, it does take time to learn how to do that and make sure that, you know, everybody has an opportunity to contribute. So I have to have people that are open-minded. You have to have people that are in the critical functioning areas, people that want to collaborate. And then most of all, you have to have people that realize that coming out of these sessions, there's action. They put it to action. They have the autonomy. They do it. I think those are really, really important team dynamics. That's really interesting. One thing you pointed out that I think is great, and I'm going to go over some of the main points you made, so I don't want to say it twice. Uh, Maybe I'll just have to take this off the list because it jumps out at me. Is You didn't just talk about temperament, the negativity, the go-getter, the team sport person. You talked about the verticals I need to cover. You said the critical functions. That's a really, really good point. It's not just the energy in the room. It's I need the experts that can inform us. Even if you're not a decision maker, I need the discrete experts in here. So that's a great observation as well, lest any of us forget that put those teams together that show up in those critical rooms. What is the saying that the sum of us is greater than the one of us? For sure. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. Three Bridges Consulting did the video on the recently rebranded NickWarnerConsulting.com. I really love the video because it helps me sell by speaking directly to my prospective clients. Dennis and Sean at Three Bridges Consulting are high-level storytellers for the purpose of helping my prospective coaching clients understand what differentiates me from the pack. A recent new coaching client literally said to me, you don't need to sell me, Nick. Your video sold me. I understand what you do and how you work with me as a client. That is a true story. You know I love that. Contact 3BC at 3BridgesConsulting.co. Ken and his team at Connect Strategies head up my post-rebrand digital marketing campaign. I'm moving up the rankings for business coaches and consultants quickly. Connect is 20 years in the business and I feel like they're really focused on my account. I refer business coaching clients to Connect too and I get really good reports on result, professionalism, and drive. Thank you, Connect. Contact Ken at K-N-E-C-H-T strategies.com. So coming up to the organization, this is the last hard question of it. I have just some easy observations um, before I overstay my welcome. So you you came up from, not the bottom, but you came up from like ground floor uh, sales or, or business development into the executive suite um, as president. How do you discipline people you've been, or fire people you've been working with for years and years because you are not one of the gang anymore. Like you're down to earth, you're humble, you're nice, you're, you know, people like you, I like you, but that's not always your role. How does that work? How do you process that personally and organizationally? You know, I said that if you ever are in a position where, you know, firing someone gets easy, you got to go. You got you to gotta change what you're doing. Letting someone go is so difficult because you take that as to some degree as a personal failure yourself. This is a, a weakness of mine to a, a, a T because I've been known to let people go a little bit longer than I should before I've made a change. I'm sort of an eternal optimist in that regard. And if I see the effort, if I see the opportunity, I'm willing to give someone a second or a third chance. But when it's an integrity issue, when it's um, a work ethic issue, when it breaks those four critical things and you've tried and you've documented and you've talked with them and you give them opportunity and um, you write up a plan and you involve other people to help you and you just realize that it's, it's to a point where you're not helping the organization, you're not helping the team and you're really not helping that person you do it as humanely as you possibly can to make sure that that person learns something from the situation. And you hope that you do prepare around it. And you just unfortunately have to sit down and have that conversation. It's tough. I mean, you, you can you can notice the demeanor in, in me having even answered that question. I absolutely hate that about any. any yeah, you're squirming all you're squirming all over the studio. Yeah, without question. Um, yeah. You said nothing's off limits. So that's the kind of things I want to know. And it's easier. It's not easy, but it's easier if you come in from the outside and you're the president of a company that you haven't been in with for 17 years and growing up with some of these people, but um, you're letting everybody down. I have made some of the same mistakes and I'm really, I've learned even through being able to interview top people on this podcast, I'm looking for pattern and practice demonstrated over time. I'm looking for lack of fidelity to the lesson that we just had. So I'm teaching the same lesson over and over again. And then I've learned over time, I have a responsibility to everybody else and their family, and you're letting the team down. Uh, I've also, I listen for can't versus won't. 
there are some things we can't do, but most of it's won't. Like, I don't want to network. I don't want to travel. Like all, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, I don't want to have the hard conversation. Like, you know, at this level, you don't really have a choice. You're letting the team down. So I look for that too, where I just can't, but I have made the same mistake. Cause frankly, like you, I have been able to save some people and a lot of issues over time, but I make the biggest mistakes in that same space where you'd say to me, really, Nick, it's the same story. The same person you've been telling me this for two years. I'm running out of sympathy for you. It's the same story. That's where I got to make a move. I look at the company, the client, everybody else's family, myself, um, and I'm getting better at that. Well, and, it, you know, when one of your greatest strengths, and I think this is one of mine, is connecting with people and feeling like you can teach them and mold them and, you know, hopefully inspire them. That's the downside to it is you believe in people so much that you really, you know, you want to you want to believe that they will. But to your point, when they won't. Unfortunately, you have to you have to make those changes. I'm thankful that I don't have to do that very often. Yeah, that's good. That's a way better plan is don't do that. Yeah, like uh, I don't know about you, but I have not fired very many people over the years. I really have not. And the assessment to good hiring and then, you know, caring and, and mentoring around them. Okay, so before I ask you what you're excited about going forward and where people can find you, can I summarize some of uh, my biggest takeaways? And uh, if, if the pattern holds, I'll re listen to this interview on my bike or something when it comes out and I'll come back to my desk and take more notes. Cause, um, you said a lot of, a lot of good things, but starting with the early lessons you learned in management training, it wasn't totally linear for you. I mean, we've definitely talked to high level folks in the show before where they were in pre-med and now they're a movie producer or they were in construction and now they're in, you know, some type of completely unrelated, you know, like say lawyer and yours is decently linear, but that early, training and dealing with people, um, your attention to management data, which was really interesting. The rolling up your sleeves, I thought was good because you got that from this baseline job. And to the extent our demographics, we have a lot of young listeners, not 18 year olds, but we have a 23 to 35 year old demographic. And I would just say like, listen to what Ann said there. There's a lot of, it doesn't have to be your final job. And you might not even have known at the time, but you took away some really important foundational skills and observations from that first job. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I know that in today's culture, it's different. You don't see as many people sticking around for 15 to, to 20 years. But I think that if a company invests in people, it, it's worth the patience, number one. Number two, continue to think of ways to grow. Always challenge yourself. That there's a better way to do things. And you can reinvent yourself with the same company. I've seen a lot of people sort of have that fear of becoming stale and to stay at the same company. And so that drives a lot of people making career changes every two to three to five years. But man, when it's right, see that the investment is there in the individual and team growth, find ways to reinvent yourself. And I just think it's the path is unlimited. I love that, especially in a decent sized company, even a smaller company, like as you go reinvite yourself, that's a really neat observation of counterbalance against your stale. You've been in the same company. Yeah. You know, and I see it with my kids, which is why, you know, I say it, but there's a lot of, well, what are you going to do for me? Right. And I do think it's important for employers to step up and to show people, but it's a partnership. It's, it's a, it's a dance. So absolutely the employer needs to be aware. And then it's on the employee to know that, Hey, you know what? You can set your own path. If your employer is listening and giving you the tools, you can set your own path and speak up. Tell us how you want to grow. Yeah. If you see something, say something, say it for yourself. I was really struck by the words you used about yourself 10 years ago or in your first 10 years and, um, and then juxtaposed with the modern era words you use. And I would, I would urge employers who are interviewing or people that are building teams to think about some of these words. Do your people have some of the words you use early on? You talk about hungry. That's my single favorite word right now in business is hungry. And I think the reason is I'm hungry in a way that I haven't been in a long time. I've always been super motivated, but when you've been doing something for 25 or 30 years, I was um, a top lobbyist in California, you know, it wears on you and it doesn't necessarily get stale because it's new. But when I started business coaching and consulting, I am hungry in a way that I haven't been. And so when people use that word and I find myself looking for that um, in other people, sponge, confident, arrogant, but not in a bad way, like these are probably traits I'd look for in somebody that I was hiring early on. And then as you rose up through the ranks, still hungry wiser, still a sponge, which I find really interesting, uncertain, which is not a word I thought you would have used in the executive, but I'm reinventing myself. And so for somebody that, you know, find out all of a sudden that through their hard work ends up at your level, it's okay to reset and be uncertain. And there's discomfort that comes with that, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's day in, day out. I think more than anything is walking in a situation 
really get a hold of your organization and to function well as a team. It's not two years. Um, hmm. And that's all I've been doing this for. So I think I'm in a meeting at least once a day where I'm a, whoa, <laughs> I'm uncertain. I got to be curious. I got to slow down. But, you know, let me be confident about what I do know to try to make the, the best decision. You touched my thought up on, I told you I disagreed with this notion that the best CEOs are, um, are from the technology side. I think they should come from the sales side. You touched me up a little bit because you said, A, I didn't come through sales, I came through business development, which I probably won't forget. That's a really good observation just going forward. But also you talked about, I got a chance to look into operations. I got a chance to look into technology. So you were, whether you were looking downfield or not and realizing I'm going to need these skills, I would urge anybody listening to this, especially if you're an emerging or, or a leader that wants to get to Ann's level, if you're in sales, if you're in technology, if you're in logistics, if you're in legal, get into those other meetings, find other mentors and learn. You said I needed to understand all the operations of the company. And I think you didn't do it through your formal job. You did it through your job and then finding collateral parallel track ways to learn the business from the ground up. That's how I heard that anyways. Yeah, I, th I think you heard that right. And I may have not uh, been clear, but you know, I started in operations with the business development as being, you know, sort of a parallel. So it was knowing the intricate details of how you provide value to a customer that you can then form that into a story. And that is how you contribute to business development. So I, I agree with you. It, it's all of those things. Um, just because you're in a certain lane doesn't mean you have to stay there. Ask the questions. Most often, at least nowadays, companies are looking for people that will step from one discipline to the next because you become so much more well-rounded at the very end. If you've got experience dealing with technologies, experience dealing with complex implementation, difficult people. And oh, by the way, you can also read a contract or negotiate one. So becoming well-rounded is really stepping from discipline to discipline. But I do need to give homage to my many, many years of operations because I had a lot of tremendous people here that were and still are tremendous colleagues, trainers, and, and just friends, actually. Yeah, be well-rounded. Yeah, really, really, really good point. You said you put a punctuation on it in a really good way. I'm not even going to try to come near your, your words um, with respect to being a woman executive and a mom. And I, but I do want to say what, part of what I teased out is, or what you said was, a lot of it wasn't because I'm a woman. It's just these jobs are hard. And then I was really struck by, and I hope people in their own way will heed your advice of ask for help. Let people know, um, use your network, uh, colleagues, family, friends, all these things. Just because you got this job doesn't mean you have it all figured out. In fact, it puts more pressure on you and the humility in that. And I've had to do that at times too. It sounds like you did it more proactive. I did it when I was in acute pain and couldn't stand it any longer and like had to find help because I was not, not dying literally, but my blood pressure was up or I wasn't being a good enough dad. So I have to say I give... But using your resources, being comfortable and humble enough to ask for help, even at your really elevated level. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, you mentioned your executive coaching. That was a godsend for me, too. Right. So um, you got to take care of the of your personal side and get the help there. I don't know anybody that really went through COVID that didn't end up getting some sort of therapy or counseling, you know, and so making sure that you have an outlet, not letting it get to that point where you feel like you're breaking, you know, we're not perfect. I've done that several times. And what I'm trying to draw on is that awareness. And through professional and personal resources, they help you become more aware. They ask you the hard questions and they're in your side. So absolutely take take people up on their willingness to help. But it is hard. It's not weakness. It's strength done right. Bring more value than cost. I love that. And so much. I'm not an inexpensive executive business coach. And I tell people straight up, I know I'm not inexpensive. I understand that. I am very motivated to take this money you're spending, which I'll say is red money because it's deficit money. And I want to make it green. I want to get in the plus side. I want to add more value. You said it way better than I say it. Bring more value than we cost. And it's not on day one. Nobody can earn it in day one. But over a short period of time, bring more value than you cost. Great way to stay employed. Absolutely. And it's like anything else. You got to live it. It sounds cliche, but when your, your client is thinking about, do I keep this person on or not? That's how they're going to be thinking about it. Do you bring more value than you cost? Simple as that. That's exactly right. And I'll tell you, I, we, you know, we are so thankful to exhibit value to our clients. I've been in situation multiple times where we've approached a customer and we've let them know, hey, look, you know, the economics of the arrangement has changed. I don't know that you can keep paying us. And, you know, the value equation is there. And the customer has said to us, we would have to add three more people to do what you do. 
you bring more value than to us than you know than we are you know, so i gig out on that too yeah it's how you know you're doing it right two last things before i turn it back to you to hear what you're excited about where we can find you is the competition for your employees is fierce really good for those of us running companies and trying to recruit and retain there's a lot of leverage on the employee side don't kid yourself they're very valuable right now and you mentioned when the company's had trouble when you've seen teams have trouble other companies too i'm going to guess is because what the phrase you used was the employees weren't the focused weren't the focus and i would also say at a time might be the client wasn't the focus but that's to me a really impactful statement it's like why are we losing people because the employees may not be the focus right now and um that's a good option painful observation but a good observation i'll go back to something i learned and and this is one of those things that just sticks with you and i don't know why it did if you take care of your employees and you take care of your customers, the bottom line will work itself out. And I really think it's it's very true. Yeah, I find myself saying in coaching, you just said a version of it. I know this is simplistic. I know it's been an axiom for 200 years. I'm like, for a reason. Yeah. There's a reason it wasn't here for like two buck chuck for six months. It's been here for 200 years for a reason because it, it works and it's true. And if you can work to that, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah, it just, it takes, it's it's a lot of discipline and you have to recalibrate, especially when you find that, oh my gosh, we were not good this last quarter. We did not do our, you know, activity where we tried to get people to engage. We didn't go out to the customers. Like you have to just sit back and recognize those things before they blow up. Does everybody do it? No, we're imperfect, but you just have to, you have to realign and you have to go back to the basics. We're going to have half the people that get a hold of me after the show because some number do. It's not half the people that listen, but some people do. Half the ones will say, I really need another hour with Ann. And the other will say, I, I only have time for an hour podcast. I could easily do. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. Tell us what you're excited about going forward in your life, in your in your business life, and where we can find you. Well, you know, I find uh, I like to get excited about just about anything because I just I love life and I love uh, being able to do different things on the business side. There are a few things that really get me excited. They're in the, the same theme of what we've been talking about, but um, continuing to build an incredible culture here with the growth that we're having is just a tremendous, exciting challenge. You've got different people with new talents coming in. You've got people that have been with the company for a long, long time that want to issue you know, wisdom and want to contribute. So continuing to evolve our culture is huge. Um, setting ourselves up to succeed and to scale it's a very difficult balance. Like I said, we were just talking about in a management meeting, but you want to do things that are personal, that hit right here and are part of your culture, but you're now having to do it with 100 employees as opposed to 40 to 50. So recognizing what those things are and figuring out how to strike that balance is, is incredible. But on the business side of the house, the company has done a tremendous job pivoting, change your business model. You have to implement a new strategy as long as I've been here, we've, you know, been a largely a service-based company supported by technology. We've dabbled into technology, recognized, oh my goodness, we do this really well. And then we started hitting really hard problems with technology and we're emerging as a product. That in itself is exciting. And so I'm really, I'm really excited to see how all the different teams that we work with start getting repositioned to, to tackle, you know, more customers. So it's really all those things and getting to know new people as they come in getting to know their family still. I, I will tell you, I make it a point of mine. I, our HR director, sorry, a bit of a tangent, sends out a personal note about every person that joins the company. And sometimes they're a little too long, but you get to know their name, you get to know their spouse, their dog, their hobbies. And so I just, that's a mission of mine to not lose sight of who is what, uh, especially when not everybody turns on their camera. But I call us a small, big company. We're still a small business, but we got big dreams. And I'm really excited to chase those. And uh, personally, it's working on those sorries that you talked about because there's so much focus that takes away from the, from the family front. But saying the sorry, being human, letting my kids see my imperfections, not dwelling on those and then showing them how to be, turn those into positives so that they can achieve what, what they want to achieve. You know, I think you and I are about the same age, but our generation was like, you have to go to college, you have to get a career and you got to go to work. And I've got two kids that are totally on opposite sides of that. You know, historically, in the way that I grew up, I would have been like, suck it up, buttercup, you're going to college. But I'm really professionally, I mean, per, uh, the professional aspect has really infused the, the personal um, aspect of, okay, let's collaborate. What do you want to do? What's going to make you feel good? You got to put the hard work in and I want to see you succeed in whatever you define, but you need to get there. And so just being a better human, I think day in, day out. 
I love it so much. If you weren't sure why I wanted to interview Ande, um, she just re-reminded you in the last uh, minute with that recap. It's really inspiring for me to hear that, especially where you are. Where can we find you, And Anybody who wants to find you, where can they find you? <laughs> well, you will find me in prices just about day in and day out. <laughs> but my boys, the football team is starting. Uh, we'll be, I'm, I'm here. I'm really trying to get very involved in our local community, the downtown Tree Fort has tremendous capability to grow. And there are several projects that are near, dear to my heart. Um, there are a couple of nonprofit organizations that I'm trying to work with. So when I'm not a priestess and I'm not being a mom, you're going to see me involved in the community or, uh, you know, just relaxing, actually. That's awesome. I like that last part. And uh, you did a marvelous job in this interview. Thank you so much. This is fun. Oh, I'm so glad you had fun. Absolutely. You did a great job. Thank you to my production team led by Dan Link, our producer, Riley Byrne at Podgy Podcast, and for our top-notch research assistant, Alex Warner. See you next month on Together at the Top. Thanks, Nick. It was great. Thank you so much for your time. Together at the Top thrives off listeners like you. To stay connected, follow our socials in the show notes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We will be releasing our show on the last Tuesday of every month. See you next time. At Nick Warner Consulting, we exist to coach and consult motivated professionals. I meet with you on Zoom in focused 90-minute sessions, working toward your goals and developing next-level business skill sets. My job is to add value to your organization and your career. To learn more, visit www.nickwarnerconsulting.com or call me directly at 916-765-3576.